Welcome to the first series of Conversation on Bayou, a podcast on traces and dreams about reframing value in business and society. I'm Valeria Maltoni, and I've been working on the question of value for more than 20 years. In this episode, we talk about the value of ethical decision-making with Professor Guido Palazzo. We all like to think we're good people, but in a toxic environment, we could go to the dark side. Strong organizational contexts push good people towards unethical decisions. In our conversation with Dr. Guido Palazzo, University of Lausanne, we will also touch upon global value chains. Conversation on Value is a podcast about how to reframe value in business and society. I'm Valeria, and I've been working on the question of value for more than 20 years. Welcome, Professor Palazzo. Benvenuto, as I would say in Italian. Um, talk, talk a little bit about uh, your work and what, what you're focusing on now. I'm a professor of business ethics. And since more than 20 years, I would say I work on what I would call the dark side of business. I've started to work in the early 2000s on human rights and supply chains. So this uh, growing imbalance between multinational corporations and their power and the power of governments to regulate them. I have then worked on organized crime in Italy. So especially the link between normal businesses and and mafia organizations. And I have done um, in-depth research on corporate scandals, trying to figure out whether or not there is a pattern that connects all of those scandals. Then if we could know that pattern, we might be able to protect ourselves and organizations better. But since focusing so much on on dark topics is not healthy um, in in recent years, I also moved into this question of how do we get out of um, such situations? Um, How do we protect organizations, but also how do we organize the ecological transition? Because with these increasing um, problems that we face, um, the acceleration of this crisis, um, the question of how do you change behavior uh, in a positive way, has moved to the to the center of my of my my interest, and here I work especially on a bit like you storytelling, narratives, and how societies are influenced by yeah you know, these belief systems that then aggregate into bigger narratives and and guide us, and how to change and disrupt them. So one of the aspects that fascinates me about um, you know, some of your research uh, and, and work that I've uh, become familiar with is the concept of framing and reframing. Can you explain a little bit uh, how we can use framing and reframing to help ourselves? Maybe if, uh, starting as, with an example of what framing is. There, w- there was a, a research done in which um, people were asked to play a game. And in this game, they could, in order to win, either compete or collaborate. And someone explains the rules to them and then tells them the name of the game is Wall Street game. In a second group, same game, same rules, same explanation. So you can either collaborate or you can compete in order to win. But this time people are told um, the name of the game is community game. And guess what happens? In the first um, variation, people compete. In the second variation, they tend to collaborate. And again, the only difference is the name of the game. That's was the title of this, uh, this scientific article, the name of the game. And what it shows is that we do not make rational decisions normally as human beings. We make decisions embedded in certain perspectives of the world. And if we are getting the perspective of competition, then we compete. If we get the perspective of collaboration, we collaborate. So if we want to influence people's behavior, one powerful way of doing this is influencing the frame through which they look at the world. So what tools do, or as you said, you work with organizations as well. What tools do organizations have at their disposal uh, that, you know, don't involve bringing in a whole team of consultants, you know, et cetera, but, you know, things that they could become more aware of to, you know, make sure that they do more of the right things. I think one, one element that companies or leaders in companies should be aware of is the power of the words that they use. And I always use this example of the, uh, the former CEO of Lehman Brothers. So this is the only bank that uh, collapsed in the financial crisis 2007. 
And he was, and the bank collapsed because they took too high risks, as the SEC found out. And he was, Richard Full, the CEO, was known for his super aggressive language. So he would tell people, for instance, we are in a war, you have to kill the enemy, I want to see bloodshed. And when he was saying kill the enemy, he was not talking about Goldman Sachs or um, JP Morgan, he was talking about the colleague next door. So they had this super aggressive internal competition. He would go down to the trading floor and take the um, tie of the second best trader and destroy it and tell everyone second best is not good enough. So he created this climate, super aggressive climate that pushed people to the limits. And the key element that he used was, was this mix of fear and language. He, he was framing the world as a war. Um, and that's what he achieved. He, he put people in the situation that they broke the rules, went for it, whatever it took, because in a war, rules don't count. So managers, in my view, must be very aware of the words they use to motivate their teams, and the language they use to justify what they do, because the way they speak um, reveals what they think and predetermines to a certain degree what they do. So there's always this link between thinking, speaking, and acting. You uh, talked about uh, ethical dilemmas and the role of what I would call the three X the speed, space, and social pressure uh, in creating an, a different kind of context or environment. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, and I think the biggest mistake that we make when we look at scandals, for instance, um, or general bad things done in organizations, that we have this knee-jerk reaction of believing if something bad is done, someone bad must have done it. So we ascribe behavior to character. We call them the bad apples. And, and we also believe that we are better than others. So we, we would consider ourselves not vulnerable to these kind of behaviors. Um, so it, it's, it's always about analyzing the person. And what I have done when I looked into corporate scandals, I was more interested in figuring out what was the context. What were the conditions under which people committed fraud, um, engaged in harassment, or broke whatever kind of rules, um, from Dieselgate to the Boeing crashes to the Uber scandal, the Theranos scandal, it's always the same. And what you find is normal people with average values or even good people participating in toxic behavior. And you cannot explain this by looking at their character. You can only understand this if you use a bit of social psychology to understand how people are influenced in what they do by the context in which they act. And there are these elements that you mentioned, for instance, um, uh, time pressure. You, if you put people on time pressure, they develop a kind of tunnel vision. If you have a tunnel vision, you go for this one little goal and you don't see left and right anymore. You don't read the warning signals or you have the, um, the, 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 the fear factor. I, you, we just see this with Elon Musk at Twitter and at, at, at um, Tesla already. You give people goals they cannot achieve. But you tell them at the same time, if you don't achieve these goals, something terrible will happen to you. So you will better achieve your goals. Uh, you build this filter technology at, at, uh, at Volkswagen, or you, you build this new airplane at, at Boeing at high speed, because you have no choice, because something terrible will happen to you. Um, with this kind of situational pressures, you can transform normal and good people into very destructive actors. And this reaches from little corporate scandals to large scale um, uh, genocidal situations in, in countries. And it explains probably also to a certain degree why we are so resistant to change with regards to the ecological crisis. We know what we have to do, but we don't do it. Do you feel that um, because we are so fragmented and so split up in like different companies, different institutions, what are your thoughts in terms of the general narrative? You know, we all know the things that we should be doing. So how can we, how can we create a different context? What kind of things can we do like every person could do? I think the, the big challenge that we face is that climate scientists for decades thought they just bring us scientific evidence and then we will act. We citizens, we politicians, we companies. And they realize we don't act um, because humans don't act on 
facts, they act on stories. We act because we believe in something. And if we believe in something and we get information that is contradictory to what we believe, then we will refuse the facts and not the story. The story will always be stronger than the facts. And the system in which we are embedded is composed of, of a combination of beliefs that then shape a larger narrative. And this na narrative is the um, neoliberal narrative. Just to give you a few elements of what, what we believe, not you and me, but what overall in society dominates and thus influences politics, uh, education, um, decisions and companies. We believe that um, free markets um, automatically lead to freedom for individuals. Um, we believe that consumption makes happy. We believe that individuals are egoistic. And we believe that the social default is fighting social Darwinism and not collaboration. Um, we believe that growth is possible forever. And we believe that if you just globalize free markets, democracy will follow. So these, these are some elements that we slowly over time developed as a narrative uh, after the Second World War. Of course, many of these elements have deeper roots there. They're part of older stories, older narratives. The, 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 the belief that humans are bad, homo economicus, is basically the old Christian um, capital sin belief. So after Adam and Eve were um, kicked out of paradise, um, everyone born is bad. And it has just been secularized in economics into the homo economicus. And then later by Richard Dawkins into the egoistic genes. But it's the same kind of old story. So you, you can trace it across history, but at any time in history, there has been a kind of collection of beliefs. And these beliefs dominate what we do. Now we are in this crisis and we realize step by step that all these elements are wrong. Free markets do not lead to the best outcome automatically. Um, humans are not just more happy because they consume more. Um, growth is not eternally possible because there are planetary limits and so on. So we start to doubt the belief. The problem is that we don't have something else to believe in. There is no ready-made alternative narrative. That was much easier for uh, the world in 1989 when communism collapsed. They could just replace Marx by the market. Um, we have nothing to take. So we are in a storytelling crisis. Antonio Gramsci calls this interregnum. So it's this phase between a narrative that is collapsing and a new one not yet born. And, and what he says is in that time, all kind of irrationalities will emerge. And another, another way of, of, of getting it is, is uh, what uh, Elena Ferrante calls frantumalia, which is just this inability to piece my identity together into something coherent. It all looks fragmented, shattered, and, and I know it, and I feel desperate about it. So we feel this lack of narrative in society, but also on the level of individual uh, disorientation. Um, that means we need a narrative. Uh, we, we have to get something pieced together in which we can believe, because we need to believe in something. You mentioned Elena Ferrante, and my first thought was to her last book, In the Margins, because I'm feeling almost like the emergent uh, narrative is there, but it's in the margins. It's mm -hmm. annotations to, you know, some of the things, because there is a lot of, you know, I don't want us to throw away the baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. It's always at the margins when a new narrative emerges. Think about how uh, St. Paul went to Rome. Um, and, and brought, brought his, his Christian belief system with him into this world of mythology. He was an outcast um, from the edge of the, of the empire, and the first people believing him were women and slaves, so the ones who were suffering in the, in the dominating narrative. Um, or think about how fascism emerged. It emerged as a mix of, a toxic mix of beliefs coming from veterans who were uh, returning from war and having no recognition of artists who believed we have to smash everything, the futurists. So it, it always comes from the uh, edge of the system. Um, but at one point, it gets momentum, it becomes bigger, and it moves mainstream. And maybe we are at that moment now where the ecological movement, which is very old, I mean, it's 1960s then, that we start talking about these things, um, starts to move mainstream.
what can we do to um, to facilitate the emergence of this alternative narrative? I guess we all have to tell these stories that we into which we want to go better. Um, how does a world look like in which there is not consumption as our defining activity? How would an organization be managed in which not growth, but maybe stability or degrowth is the right um, vision? Um, how do you work in a, in a world that is continuously disrupted as ours will be in the future? So we have to imagine life in maybe 50 years, how it will look like a desirable future, not a doomed future, and then ask ourselves, how do we get there? And there's a new genre in literature called uh, hope punk. They do this. Um, they try to figure out a far away better future, and then we have to think about how to get there. But if we don't develop such a vision, people will not be motivated to make sacrifices or to change their routines. Why would I stop eating meat um, if, if I have no nothing to believe in where this decision is an important um, uh, piece. So we need the vision and this vision we have to narrate together and we need maybe a few storytellers who stick out and to, to help us to develop this new narrative. So you talked about, I want to bring together because uh, you talk about a lot uh, of inter interdisciplinary uh, work and, and framing. And um, you mentioned um, belief, right? And you mentioned secular, uh, and uh, you mentioned saints, and you mentioned philosophers um, um, together in this conversation, and mythology. And so uh, we have these stories that have formed the current narrative, which is running out of Jews. And we have these other elements that also have roots in the past. Um, so belief, um, you know, religious belief, uh, in a, you know, in, in a kind of uh, agnostic in a way, right? Uh, but just you know, kind of this desire to build community, uh, the mythology. So the desire to tell stories, uh, to try to understand uh, ourselves, the Greek mythology. Help me, you know, kind of can how can we um, value ethics again? And it's not that ethics is absent uh, in our narrative that, that we have right now. It's a particular form of ethics. It's utilitarian ethics that, that is building on this assumption that um, the right decision is the one that maximizes output for the greatest number of people. So it's an output-oriented ethics. And since you somehow have to measure that, um, they took money to measure it. So at the heart of our economic theory, and since that theory dominates society at our society, is this idea of monetizing um, a maximum of output to measure the happiness of people. So GDP is measured um, as a kind of a, a, a means to, to understand the happiness of individuals and progress of societies, which as we understand now doesn't make sense. But uh, it, it did make sense for a while. So that's the point, a narrative, has always some value for a particular moment in history. Otherwise it would not exist. It would not survive the competition of narratives. Um, and as long as you have endless resources because you can take them from others, uh, the, the, the colonial story, um, you, it makes sense to believe in endless resources and growth and, and everything and consumption. But at the moment where you believe clash with reality, that's where you need something new. And the, the points that you mentioned, the beliefs, the saints, the, uh, the, the, the religion, th that shows our dilemma because, yeah, someone has called this um, the suspension of disbelief. Coleridge was his name. And he said, well, well if, we, if we want to believe in a narrative, we have to stop asking questions. We have to stop asking whether this is really, really true. Um, we have to believe that if you reduce tax of rich people, it trickles down to the poor. We have to believe it. It's, it's, it's like magic. And of course, it doesn't happen. Um, it never happened. Um, but if you don't switch off the disbelief, the narrative doesn't work. And we are at the first time in human history at a point where we have to consciously create a narrative 
and then switch off the disbelief. So they believe it um, after a while. And that is the big challenge. And I don't have the answer how to do this, um, but we have to be aware of that. There's always magic in a narrative. It has been there in our enlightenment, neoliberal utilitarian one as well. There's, there's the magic of the market as Ronald Reagan called it. The, the magic of the belief that if I buy some stuff, I become somehow immortal via the stuff I buy. So th there's magic in any narrative. Otherwise it doesn't work. What will be our magic? That's the big question. You talked about vision um, and that's one component uh, that companies look at, right? The vision of the leader, et cetera. And I wanted to get a little bit into the conversation around value and values, the relationship between the two, because sometimes they're used interchangeably. Uh, and I think it would be helpful to think about what are the dynamics. I think the, the, the reason why we use this interchangeably is what I just described, this utilitarian philosophy to believe that the values result from the value we aggregate economically for the greatest number of people. Um, so that automatically higher value leads to better values in the long run. And again, we, don't, we see now that this doesn't work. Um, now, what are values? That's always yeah, these challenging questions. We, it's so easy to see it when we, when we are facing it, but so difficult to describe. I always use the story of uh, Max Weber, to explain this, when he was once traveling through the USA, he was sitting on a train and he was traveling through a region that was very religious. And there was a salesman sitting with him on that train and he was telling him that he was surprised by this high religiosity of the people in that region. And the salesman answered to him, uh, I don't care what people believe, but if they believe in nothing, why would they pay me? What it means is we, we, we want interaction with others only if we know that they believe in something and that something overlaps sufficiently with my beliefs. We don't go to a doctor if the doctor has a sign in his waiting room, I want to maximize profit. That's not what we're going to do because we want the doctor to believe in something and that something cannot be just the monetary value. And if we are as in organization and companies not able to show that as a company, we believe in something that is bigger than just money. Um, well, then any discussion on purpose and whatever it is uh, will not be credible. You have to live it like Patagonia lives it, um, like men, some other companies live it. Um, and that's the art. Um, because it, as we learned from Aristotle, if you don't practice it, the ethics it becomes weak. It's like a muscle. Train it every day. Show it in your behavior. And that is not just relevant for this discussion on changing society. It is also a key element of the understanding of why scandals happen, because leaders signal to their followers that they just have one value, and that is making as much money as possible. So walk, walk the talk. Walk the talk, yes. Um, but, but, but talk in a broader visionary way and do not, not focus just on shareholder value focus on your understanding of where society is going, uh, what your role in this ecological transition will be, and, and how do you want to contribute to making this world a better place? And that can, the answer cannot be, no longer be, by increasing shareholder value. You mentioned Patagonia. Can you tell me a little bit more about the trade-offs and the ethical decision-making that the company is uh, undergoing? I don't know whether they have particular trade-offs compared to others. Um, um, they might make less money here and there in particular decisions, but overall their success depends on the credibility of their story. So maybe their financial success as well is the result of making such sacrifices here and there, such as uh, the situation when Donald Trump was reducing tax for big companies um, they announced, we don't, we don't think this is right and we don't want that money. And they donated this to uh, environmental um, organizations. So they, they are consistent in their behavior. Um, and that makes the difference. Um, if you're consistent, even if it costs money, well, then you are credible. So I don't see a trade-off here. The, the trade-off 
is present in any kind of ethical decision in any kind of organization because our idea that ethics is about right versus wrong is not is not correct ethics most of the time is operating in a zone of gray between something right against something else seemingly uh, similarly right and then making a decision in which you make your hands dirty because you have to violate some of your values to live some other values that's the trade off we always face all the time so i wonder out loud with you what that does to my ability to uh, make promises okay do you do you have a sense because right we have a trade off it's an ethical dilemma and so we choose one thing versus another uh, hopefully based on context and yeah. um yeah i mean a, a promise is a good example to to understand the difference between a real and a wrong dilemma let's assume you make a promise to a friend to help her with some work and then the sun is shining and you want to go to the beach and it's, it, it don't you're not really interested in helping in this moment because this, the sun is shining and you decide to lie to your friend that you are not feeling well and you go to the beach that is not a dilemma because from a kantian perspective this is a morally right decision keeping a promise against an interest an egoistic interest i want to go to the beach there's no value in that uh, apart from it makes me happy but ethics is never about only me it's about social interaction so that's a wrong dilemma but imagine you made that promise to her to help her but then you figure out that it's the, the birthday of your grandmother and she would be super super disappointed and suffering if you wouldn't come and who knows how long she will still be alive that's a dilemma because it's the loyalty to your grandmother her expectations your duty uh, towards her against this duty to keep a promise and whatever you decide here you will have to violate some of your values um, that's a dilemma so what what i always recommend is try first to understand what are your options when you are in a decision making situation then ask yourself um, can i universalize a decision in one or the other direction ask yourself which values that are important for me are in one or the other um, option um, who is affected and how so we we can ask us a series of questions it's a toolbox of ethics and then make a decision but we should be aware of the fact that it remains a trade off it remains a compromise it remains a situation of what jean paul sartre called the dirty hands what are you focusing on now uh, we talked about you know what each we can do to contribute to the new narrative and um, what's what's your research where is your research leading you to well i'm, I'm right now in two projects one is um, as i mentioned i'm, I'm pas passionate about these corporate scandals and not just corporate uh, all kind of big organizational scandals and and by this question of whether or not there is a pattern behind all of them is there always the same things that happen and i'm currently analyzing um, all the big scandals of the last 20 years and i think i i found a pattern and i'm writing a book on that so that's one project i mean and the second one is this narratives um, project where i try to figure out how do narratives change by doing some historical analysis and and asking myself what is the storytelling material that is lying around right now um, that might help us to shape a new narrative and how do we do this so that people believe in it so these are my two projects right now thank you thank you again for joining us for this conversation on value I'm your host, Valeria Maltoni. I hope you'll join us again for our next conversation on Traces and Dreams. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with your network and subscribe.